Well, good morning, everyone. Hope everybody had a great week. Hope everybody's enjoying Gather Group this morning. Um, just look around the people that are in the room with you, or if you're by yourself, you need to be maybe inviting somebody into, um, into your life or what's going on, but um, just look around. These are the people you're doing life with. and um, So just kind of look around each other and maybe smile, laugh, have a little bit of fun. You know, part of this journey with Jesus is journeying together with a, a community, a group of people. Um, and he always calls us never to forsake the gathering in Hebrews. Um, so um, continue to draw, bring people um, that you want to include in your groups. Invite them in. Um, it's always um, better to do life with um, people that you like to journey with. And um, so continue to um, invite people in around you. Um, we've got another first Sunday coming up um, in about three weeks. Um, so it be another place, another opportunity for, um, to invite people to. All right, so let's get started this morning. Um, I want to continue on last week. Um, first Sunday was last week. Um, and if you missed that, we missed having you. Um, also, we had worship night on Thursday night, which was um, absolutely um, amazing. It was another great night. Um, and so the Lord just continues to be faithful to us. Um, and so don't miss, if you have an opportunity um, to keep your calendars open, don't miss for Sundays, don't miss um, our worship nights. And we have another one scheduled for September the 30th. Um, and so just put that on your calendar. That'll be when our next one is. Um, we're going to try to do one once a month um, as well as our gatherings um, just to continue um, to stay together and things. Okay, um, so we're going to continue on to today. Um, 2 Corinthians, um, first Sunday I was in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. And the message was coming out of, um, the, the brunt of the message was, there's, we don't want to lose heart in life. In other words, as we're walking in life and we're moving through things that are difficult or we're moving through normal life, and things become challenging, we don't want to lose heart. And, and Paul says in, you know, in that passage, um, he says, for these light momentarily aff afflictions that we have, these things that um, are just small and um, in eternity, there's, there's this weight of glory that's being, being created, that's being unveiled, that's um, much greater than what we're presently going through. And so this wants to make us shape our mindset. Um, verse um, 18 in that passage says, we don't look at the things... Um, that are temporal or the things that are right in front of us because these things are passing away. We look at the things that are, um, are unseen, which they are eternal. For the things that are unseen are eternal. The things that you see um, are only um, for a time and a period, and then they will not be. Um, so us being eternal, this is the things that matter. If you look around in the room, these things matter. The people that you know and rub shoulders with, those things matter. But so we're getting an eternal perspective <clears throat> so that we can operate <clears throat> from a standpoint of seeing what is unseen by faith so that we can operate in present moments today. Because what we're going through in our country and in, in our world and in our lives, those things that are happening right now, we have to view things from eternity so that we're able to operate properly in the present day and not getting, not lose faith, not lose confidence, not lose hope, um, so that we can look to the unseen, the thing that is eternal. So <clears throat> with that, I want to look at how do we view rest? Um, how do you view rest in all of this? Now we're going to be in Hebrews today, Hebrews um, chapter 3 and 4 for a little bit, and we're also going to be back in Matthew um, chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And it's important that our eternal perspective <clears throat> will shape how we um, process difficult moments and also how we view rest as well. So, you know, we're called to be in rest and to live in rest. And rest is not a place, it, it's not a, um, in the sense of what we're talking about, it's not a verb, it's a noun. Rest is a place. So go ahead and turn to Hebrews. We want to talk about rest being a place because if we can get this worked out as rest being a place, then our eternal perspective and how we carry who Jesus is in moments in time and how we stay connected to the vine, 
that becomes um, a lot more clear. So Hebrews chapter 3, I want you to think about this. Rest is a place. This is what in the Old Testament, this is what in Hebrews 3, the writer is pulling this out about Moses. So beginning uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him, talking about the Father who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all of his house. For this one has been counted worthy for more glory than Moses, talking about Jesus, as much as he who built the house has more honor than the house. Talking about Jesus, he's the one building the house, which just pause for a second. We should be super encouraged because God's building this house. Jesus is building the house, the church. Um, so we can be a part of it, but we don't have to be overwhelmed by it. Verse 4, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Verse 5, and Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken of afterward. But, verse 6, Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Okay, now stop right there. That's a, that's a lot staying there. That last verse 6, the writer just kind of summarizes everything. He calls us the house. He calls the church, the people around you, the house. He says, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. So we are his own house. So you've got to begin to think about this. We are the house of Jesus. We're, we are the, um, we're actually the vessels that he has chosen to dwell in. Um, because we are in the, the new covenant, the old covenant. You know, Graham Cook puts it this way. The old covenant, God was a God of visitation where he visited upon those and he came upon the kings and the prophets. But in the New Testament, He is the God of habitation. He inhabits us. He inhabits things. So He never leaves us or forsakes us. So says, he says, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And so there's a confidence and rejoicing and a hope that we have in Jesus um, in that eternal place that we bring into a daily place. So in other words, confidence, rejoicing, and hope, we have to hold those things. Those things have to continue to be held, and I think they have to be held and made um, a greater revelation of every day, even as we proceed through time. In other words, you don't just, confidence is always growing, rejoicing is always growing, our hope is always growing. And the writer tells us to hold it firm to the end, like firm to the end of our life, or firm to the end before Jesus comes back. But this is what he begins to say about rest in verse 7, because he's going to give <clears throat> an understanding of rest being a place. Remember, rest is a place. In the Old Testament, it's going to be a place. In the New Testament, it's going to be a person. Verse 7, Therefore the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, talking about Jesus, talking about the Father, talking about the Spirit, if you listen and hear it, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. He's talking about in the Old Testament in the wilderness in the day of the trial in the wilderness, where the fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Okay, now this place of rest here was Canaan. This was the promised land that he had promised. He says, this, you are going to journey for 40 years and you're going to enter my rest. It was a place. It was a place of promise. It was a place of inheritance. It was their place to enter into. Um, and if you remember specifically about this story he's talking about, it's back in Numbers. If you remember the story, um, this is where the spies went in, um, spied the land out, and came out and said, we can go in. We can." Two of them says, we can take the land, Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 of the 12 said, no, there were great giants in the land. There were things we couldn't overcome in the land. And they operated in fear and unbelief. And therefore, God says, you will not enter my rest. In other words, you will not enter into the promised land. That generation 
that was age 20 and above, excluding Joshua and Caleb, perished in the desert in that 40-year journey because of not listening to the voice of the Father and having a hardness of heart and unbelief. So if you look right there in verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil unbelief of unbelief in departing from the living God. It says, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So there is a part in this belief plays in. Belief will allow us to enter into rest. Belief in the Old Testament would allow them to enter into the promised land, which was their place of rest. Belief for us allows us to enter into that place of rest in Jesus. Hold your finger right there. Let's go look and I'll show you that Jesus is our rest. He is our place of rest. He's our person of rest. Hebrews 11, verse 25. At the time Jesus answered and said to them, I thank you, Father, Lord in heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and you have revealed them to babes. Continue on. Even so, Father, for so I seem good to you in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, but the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Now, he's building a little context behind this because he's talking about um, as he's walking through and he's been visiting cities and people um, are not receiving Him, so he's talking about their unbelief of their hearts. But then he says, verse 28, He says, Come to me, all you who labor and have heavy laden or heavy burdens, Come to me, if you have those burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now see, when we begin to view things from eternity, we're going to view things from an eternal perspective. Rest becomes this person of Jesus, not heaven. Of course, heaven is rest. But it becomes the person of Jesus becomes our rest. And so as we continue to stay attached to the divine and our belief, our rest is found in this person of Jesus. So he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden or have great burdens, and I will give you rest. So he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So it literally means to like, the illustration in this is the yoke um, of two oxen. An older oxen would always train the younger oxen. And so they were training, there would be a yoke, and the yoke is kind of, if you, a yoke is like a, uh, a small M, right? Um, and underneath it, the big ox would be under one side of the yoke, and the young ox would be under the other yoke. The yoke would never touch the shoulders of the young ox. It would only be on the older mature ox. And the young ox was learning to walk beside and, and, under, and know how to stay in position while the older ox was training it and carrying all the weight. And see, this is the place of rest that Jesus has for it. He says, take my yoke because I take all the weight and all the burden. So the things that you identify with and you say that are yours, my stress, my anxiety, um, my whatever, <clears throat> whatever thing we identify as mine um, that he's paid for already with his blood, with his sacrifice, with his resurrection, whatever thing we say that it's, it's mine, it's his. He says, take my yoke upon me. So you need to look at it and go like, when you said yes to Jesus, you took his yoke upon you. And he says, take it upon me. So you really, <clears throat> in belief, we need to take it upon us even daily. Like, Jesus, I let your yoke rest on me. And so... I, our stuff becomes his stuff, and we're walking beside him, but he's carrying the weight and teaching us how to be in him in rest as a person, not just a place. He says he's gentle and lowly in heart. It means he's approachable. It means he's not going to look at us and go, I can't believe you're thinking that way. I can't believe you're still struggling with this. He says, no, there's an abundance of grace that's on your life, and there's this righteous gift I've given you so that you may walk in such a way that the unseen world shapes how you respond to everything around you. 
That's when the kingdom of God becomes manifest, is when we begin to live out of that unseen place because we're identifying the fact that we're, our rest is in the person of Jesus. It's not in, like a, it's not like in our bedroom. It's not like in um, our, you know, in the back. It's not like in a nap. Our rest is found in this person, which allows us to fully operate. And it's always rest is attached to belief. Rest is attached to belief. Remember, go back to Hebrews. Verse 11, I swore in my wrath, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 11, I swore in my wrath, wrath that they shall not enter my rest. Now look at 12, look what the writer says. He's beware, brothers, brothers and sisters, lest there be any of you in you an, un, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It's the only thing that makes us begin to enter out of rest is unbelief. Unbelief pulls us out of rest and pulls us into striving. As a matter of fact, we want to actually get underneath the yoke and we want to somehow manufacture a way to carry our burdens when they're not even ours to carry. Look at verse 13. But exhort one another daily why it is called today, lest any one of you harden or harden through the deceitfulness of sin. So verse 13, so right now, we need to encourage one another. This is why we gather in gather groups and, and create relationships. This is why we um, gather on first Sundays in a broader setting. All this is designed by the Father. It's designed for us to encourage one another that while today is still today, in other words, while we still have a pulse before Jesus comes back or before we die, He says while today is still today, we, we encourage one another daily. Hey, are you finding rest in Jesus? Is His yoke, are you laying your stuff on His? Or have you said His stress, this stress is not my stress, it's His. Uh, let it go to Him. Do we begin to reshape that perspective? Because think, we're, gonna, we're living eternally, so we don't really have anything to lose. The greatest thing we do is have to gain all of the kingdom to be manifest in our presence today. The, you know, successful businesses, you know, healed bodies, um, you know, saved souls, people delivered, um, freedom from um, all the anxiety of the worldly things. The things that begin to, to get shaped in our lives because um, we are operating out of a person of Jesus and we're operating out of belief and we're operating out of rest. When we're not operating in unbelief, which is the, um, I think, it's the biggest, it's the sin that Jesus rebuked the most to his disciples. How is it that you have a hard heart and you operate in all this unbelief? So he says, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers. We have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Part of this is <clears throat> as we hear, as we hear the Lord, as we hear the Lord um, in, in his word, as we take what he says in his word um, at face value, we begin to look at that, he says, you know, Israel went in. God said, hey, I'm giving you the promised land. And they had all this history of overcoming. I mean, they had gone across the Red Sea. They had seen all of Egypt defeated. And they journeying in the desert, and he takes them into the promised land. And um, so the track record is, is that we're going to take that. It's going to be that I've given to you. And literally... Um, Joshua and Caleb, they say, hey, this is bread to us. Like our enemies are bread in our mouth. They, they, well, let's consume them. And the unbelief comes in because they began to see and focus on what the, the natural thing was, what the temporal thing was, right? Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this light momentary affliction. So they looked at the temporal things and, and they were scared. They said, we're like grasshoppers. We're afraid to go in. And so fear began to set in. And then unbelief, we can't do this. 
And as all that set in, they began to not listen to the voice of the Lord and began to give in to their natural circumstances. And they lost focus. And they lost the voice. And they hardened their hearts. And they said, we cannot go in. And so when we begin to operate in that manner of unbelief, when His voice is spoken to us, when He says, hey, I'm your provision. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So when he, Jesus continues to instruct us and He says, I am your rest. I, come find rest in me. Only believe. This is the work that you do. Believe. These are the things that we have to continue to encourage ourselves in and walk as believers and walk as those who are of an unseen world. That's where rest exists. It exists by pulling that in because otherwise we get to be like Israel and we, un we see all the testimony of the Lord and we even know some promises in our life, but the temporal things, the light momentary things overtake us and we don't consider the weight of glory that's being created in heaven for us and this weight that's happening. And so we don't allow the weight of this daily moments to come off. We take those on and we identify them as my weights and my stuff. It's a perspective shift in how we believe and how we look <clears throat> at rest and how we see the things that are eternal, not the things um, that are passing away. So I'm going to continue to build this upon us because I want us to, to get this is that our belief and our unbelief both work for or against us. And rest, when we're in full rest, doesn't mean that we're inactive, but we're in full rest. It means we're, in, we're aware of Jesus, we're aware that we're, with, we're within Him, we're aware that we're abiding in Him, and we're taking His yoke upon us. And we're looking at our circumstances and our situations, and we're saying, Jesus, these um, are yours. You said, you said to take your yoke upon you and that I should lay all my burdens down on you. And so I lay these down on you and I pick up and I shift my mindset and I look at things that are unseen, not the things that are seen, so that I can bring life and hope and confidence, right? Go back to verse 6. It says, We hold fast to confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. This is talking about Jesus in us and the life that we have in Him. Okay, so today in your gather groups, cultivate, like, like turn this up a little bit. Like, can, see that you can find rest as a place of, as the person of Jesus, not just a place like in the Old Testament where it was a promise. Even beyond the promise, Jesus is the person. He is the rest. And so maybe talk about what... Um, battles against your rest or what battles against what unbelief um, battles and shift your mindset to so talk about that today in your gather groups um, and remember um, this week um, as you're going forward there are people around you that need what you have um, so remember it's significant um, the life that you have within you that life of Jesus people need to be encouraged they need to be encouraged that hey there's a greater reality outside of your circumstance. Um, and I want to remind you of that. I want to remind you of that greater reality so that we can get through what we're going through. Y'all have a great week. Talk to you soon.